and a very warm welcome to all of you listening. I hope that you are both physically and spiritually in good shape. We continue on today with our study of Mark's Gospel. Today's reading is taken from chapter 15, and I'll be reading verses 42 to 47. Mark chapter 15, verses 42 to 47. Now when evening had come, because it was the preparation day, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent council member, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, coming and taking courage, went into Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate marvelled that he was already dead, and summoning the centurion, he asked him if he had been dead for some time. So when he found out from the centurion, he granted the body to Joseph. Then he brought fine linen, took him down and wrapped him in the linen, and he laid him in a tomb which had been hewn out of the rock, and rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. And Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph observed where he was laid. This is the word of the Lord. Before we look at today's passage of scripture, which concerns Jesus' burial, let's review what we looked at last Sunday. We spoke in some detail about Jesus' death upon the cross. In particular, we looked at the five dramatic events that accompanied our Saviour's death. Mark tells us that the first dramatic event was a darkness that had descended upon the land. This darkness covered the earth from 12 noon until 3 p.m., This, as I told you last time, was no ordinary solar eclipse. Jesus' crucifixion took place during the celebration of Passover, a time when the moon is full, not the time when solar eclipses are naturally possible. So what happened here was a supernatural event. God stepped in and temporarily interrupted the normal running of his creation. This is something that, as its creator and sustainer, is his divine prerogative, It is, however, something that God rarely chooses to do. So why then did he choose to do so here? Many scholars connect this darkness to the words of the prophet Amos. He had prophesied that on God's day of judgment, God will make the sun go down at noon. We can also draw a parallel with what happened around the time of the first Passover, back in Egypt. The ninth plague that God sent upon the Egyptians was three days of darkness, This event was followed by the tenth plague, the death of the firstborn. A death that was passed over in the case of the Israelites, who killed a lamb and spread its blood around the doorframe. Here, at this momentous Passover, we see a similar pattern emerge. A period of darkness, in this case three hours, followed by a death and the shedding of the lamb's blood, which results in much greater Passover. It's also interesting to think about the darkness covering the land as a recreation event. Let me take you back to the opening of scripture. In the beginning there was only darkness or chaos. As we read in Genesis chapter 1 verse 2, the earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep. This was because before the creation event there was an absence of design or order. As God spoke he created order. He introduced light and design and, in effect, dispelled chaos. Here, Jesus on the cross again speaks into the darkness and through his acts and words brings order. He once and for all time defeats the power of darkness and chaos. At the moment of his death draws near, Jesus cried out. These were the second and third dramatic events. Jesus' first words, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? reflect his unbearable anguish at his estrangement from God. At this moment, bearing our wretched sins, he was temporarily separated from fellowship with the Father. And it was this estrangement, and not the intense physical pain, that made the Lord Jesus cry out. Those standing nearby mishear his cry. They think that he is calling out to Elijah. The prophet Elijah, who was taken directly up to heaven without dying, was always regarded as a messianic type figure. The belief was that he would return to rescue the righteous when needed. So the people think that Jesus is calling out to him in his hour of need. 
It's also at this point that Jesus is offered some wine on a stick. I spoke last week about how his severe physical condition may have left him with extreme thirst. Following this, his mission complete, the Lord Jesus dies. It's 3pm. At the moment of his death, we see the fourth dramatic event take place. The large curtain or veil in the temple is torn from top to bottom. This immense curtain divided the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple. The Holy of Holies, of course, represented God's divine presence. Only the high priest was permitted to enter this most sacred of areas, and on just one day of the year. The symbolic meaning, then, is not difficult to discern. The old system or way of approaching God is now becoming obsolete. Now, through Christ's sacrifice, believers are given full, direct and permanent access into the presence of God. The fifth and final dramatic event was the declaration made by the Roman centurion. He was almost certainly the leader of the execution squad, and it was his job to supervise the execution of the condemned men, including the Lord Jesus. He was most probably a seasoned veteran, a man who had seen and dispensed death on many occasions. As he watches Jesus die, he exclaims, Truly this man was the Son of God. We don't know, of course, exactly what he meant by this, and we examined some of the possibilities last time. Whatever lay behind his words, though, he did speak the truth. We concluded last time by mentioning the women who looked on and watched in horror and great sadness. Mark tells us that amongst this group were Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and Salome. These women had joined Jesus back in Galilee and had followed him as he travelled around. They had offered him their support and help as he lived as an an itinerant preacher and teacher. We should not overlook or ever minimise the importance of their role. Jesus was a radical rabbi. In a culture that shunned and often looked down upon women, Jesus did quite the opposite. He welcomed, taught, respected and loved women. Now these women who had given up all to follow him looked on as the man they had grown to love breathed his last. That they were present and witnessing all that transpired will later serve to be significant. Today we will turn and look at what happened following Jesus' death. Verse 42. Now when evening had come, because it was the preparation day, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Jesus is dead. His precious body remains nailed and hanging on the cross. Mark tells us that evening had come. The Jews recognised two evenings, early evening, which extended from 3pm to 6pm, and evening, which meant any time after 6pm. By the Jewish way of reckoning, this was when the new day began. Mark here refers to the preparation day. This was the period of time that stretched from Thursday dusk to Friday dusk. As its name suggests, this was the time when Jewish people readied everything for the Sabbath. We must remember that no work could actually be undertaken on the Sabbath day. So food needed to be prepared and cooked, wood chopped for the fire, and the animals had to be tended. Also included as work, and as a consequence forbidden on the Sabbath, would be preparing a body for a burial. Therefore, if his followers want Jesus to be accorded a proper burial, they will need to work quickly. They must seek permission to take down his body, prepare a shroud or the linens and spices, remove his body and put the corpse in the tomb. All of this has to be completed before 6pm or sundown, on the Friday, when the Sabbath officially begins. We know, of course, that the disciples, John accepted, have fled. Only the women followers remain. So who will step up and offer to Betty Jesus? Well, let's read on and find out. Verse 43. Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent council member, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, coming and taking courage, went into Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Step forward, Joseph of Arimathea. This fascinating biblical character is mentioned in all four gospel accounts, 
but only in relation to Jesus' burial. This is his first mention in Mark's Gospel. While there is not much information in the Bible regarding Joseph of Arimathea, there are certain things we can glean from the various texts which mention him. Let us deal firstly with his name and town of origin. Joseph was a common name in the first century, and there are a number of Josephs mentioned throughout Scripture. Therefore, to help avoid confusion, Mark includes his town of origin as an identifier. The Judean town of Arimathea is said to have been located about 20 miles northwest of Jerusalem. Next, we are told that he was a prominent member of the council. This means that he was a member of the Sanhedrin. This council, which contained 71 members, was the highest authority in the land. So to be a member made you a very important or special person. You would be someone that was looked up to and had respected and or even admired. New members had to be voted in by the council, and if an existing member died, a replacement would be picked from amongst their exclusive ranks. So what I'm trying to impart here is that Joseph was a prominent Jew. We also learn something interesting about his character. He was a member of the council, of course, that had gathered and called for Jesus' death. But Luke tells us that Joseph was a good and just man, who disagreed with the Sanhedrin's efforts to try and crucify Jesus. So we are seeing here something of Joseph's character emerge. A strong-minded, independent thinker, not a man easily swayed by the weight of peer pressure. We also learn from Matthew that he was rich. The source of his wealth is unknown, but the fact that he owned his own, as yet unused, tomb suggests that he was a wealthy individual. Finally, and most importantly, we learn that he was a follower, actually a disciple of Jesus. Mark tells us that he was waiting for the kingdom of God. This means that he was a devout Jew who had come to faith in Jesus Christ. However, John also tells us that while Joseph did follow Jesus, he did so secretly in fear that the other members of the Sanhedrin will find out. What, you might wonder, became of Joseph of Arimathea, the Bible never mentions him again following his involvement in the burial of Jesus. Did he go on and join the early church in Jerusalem? Well, his fate remains a mystery. Legend has him becoming the first Christian missionary to come to Britain. Apparently, he carried the Holy Grail to Britain and founded Glastonbury Abbey. It's a nice story, but sadly unlikely to be true. Let's get back to the Bible account. Joseph then steals himself to go and visit Pilate. Why, you might ask, did this act take courage? Well, there are two different components that we need to consider. Firstly, we must consider his standing in Jewish society. He was a member of the Sanhedrin, and they had just declared Jesus to be guilty of blasphemy. To them, Jesus was the worst kind of offender, an enemy of God. They would have wanted Jesus' body to have been taken down from the cross and thrown into a common grave. This was the outcome for many victims of crucifixion. So had they known that Joseph, accompanied by Nicodemus, had gone to Pilate to ask for Jesus' body, there would have been serious ramifications. Secondly, we have to consider his request to the Roman authorities. To the Romans, Jesus was guilty of high treason. He claimed to be king and claimed to usurp the authority of Caesar. For such an offence, it was unusual to leave the body hanging on the cross. The corpse would be left to rot and to be picked at by the birds of prey. It was intended as an additional layer of humiliation and to serve as a warning to others. Eventually, the body would be taken down and thrown into a garbage pit. However, if the family requested the body, it was fairly common that the authorities would hand it over for a proper burial. But Joseph was not a family member, so he cannot really know, have known how Pilate would take his request. He might have faced animosity or even scorn. So therefore, courage was required. But let's continue and see how Pilate responds. Verses 44 and 45. Pilate marvelled that he was already dead, and summoning the centurion, he asked him if he had been dead for some time. So when he found out from the centurion, 
he granted the body to Joseph. Pilate was surprised to hear that Jesus had already died. This was because crucifixion was designed to be a long, slow, agonising death. Today, in places where capital punishment is still carried out, the process is quick. Authorities want to dispatch convicted criminals in the most efficient and humane way possible. In the United States, for example, the most commonly used form of execution is the lethal injection. 28 US states authorise this method of execution. Killing convicted criminals in this way is relatively quick. In most cases, death can be confirmed within 10 minutes of administering the first of three separate injections. But making the death quick was not a concern to the Romans. In fact, they had purposefully designed crucifixion to be the exact opposite. They wanted the victim to die slowly in great pain. Today, the thought of this unnecessary cruelty horrifies us. But let us consider for a moment the Romans' motivations. They were attempting to hold together a vast and diverse empire. And whilst it's true that they possessed a large, well-equipped and well-trained army, but in truth they were always vastly outnumbered by those they ruled over, the peace of the empire was a fragile thing. So a strong legal system backed up by harsh punishment was one effective means of maintaining order. We see the opposite working today, particularly in Western Europe. When laws and punishments are weak, it serves to embolden bad behaviour. If you gauge the odds of being caught to be low, and then combine this with a weak judicial system, what's the deterrent to committing crime? Let me give you a shocking example. Between October 22nd, 2022 and September 22nd, 2023, 67,938 rapes were reported to the UK authorities. Of these rapes, only 2.4%, or a little over 1,600, resulted in the rapists being caught and charged by the police. So UK rapists, or potential rapists, have close to a 98% chance of being able to get away with rape. That's far from being a massive deterrent. So the Romans were harsh and cruel because they knew it it worked. You would certainly think twice about becoming a thief if you knew being caught might result in crucifixion. So Jesus' death, which took place after six hours, was short by usual crucifixion standards. At times it took up to 48 hours or even longer for a person to die. In some rare cases it might ta even take up to six days. As an interesting aside... The Jehovah's Witnesses claim that Jesus was crucified on a torture stake and not on a cross. They claim it was a single stake with no crossbeam and so his hands were lifted above his head and nailed to the stake. Now let's be fair and honest, the Bible is not clear on the exact shape of Jesus' cross. However, there is very good medical evidence that strongly works against it being a torture stake. In an article on crucifixion in the Guardian newspaper regarding how crucifixion kills, psychologist Jeremy Ward noted that the torture stake form of crucifixion was the most severe. This is due to the extreme difficulty of breathing in this position. Death, he claimed, would occur in less than 30 minutes. And yet we know that Jesus survived on the cross for six hours. So for this reason alone, I think we can dismiss the torture stake theory. Well, let us continue. We do know from the Gospel record that the two robbers crucified alongside him were not yet dead. The Roman soldiers were forced to break their legs in order to hasten their demise. In order to breathe on the cross, it required you to push yourself up using your legs. With broken legs, you could not do this and hence died quickly. Jesus had been discovered to already be dead. This was verified when a soldier stabbed him in the side with his spear. Pilate then summons the centurion and finds out that Jesus had indeed died. It's noteworthy that Pilate investigated things for himself. He didn't simply take the news about Jesus' death at face value. It's a good reminder to us that we need to investigate any claims that are made to us. The centurion, who had spent his professional career as a soldier, surrounded by death, confirmed that Jesus had been dead for some time. 
Pilate then agreed to give the body to Joseph. It was unusual to give the corpse of a person condemned for treason to anyone but a family member. We are left then to wonder whether Pilate felt some guilt about what had happened to Jesus. Did he hand over the body to Jesus because he felt some shame? Well, let's continue and see what Joseph does with the body. Verse 46. Then he brought fine linen, took him down and wrapped him in the linen. And he laid him in a tomb which had been hewn out of the rock, and rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. Every culture has its own rituals or ways of handling bodies and preparing them for either burial or cremation. For the Jews it was generally a quick process, and this was especially true in Jesus' case, because it had to be done before the Sabbath began. So the Lord Jesus is taken down from the cross, and Nicodemus and Joseph, most likely assisted by their servants, go through the burial rituals. Normally the first step would have been the ritual of washing the body. This is not mentioned as happening here, but we need to remember that they had to work quickly. There is also no anointing of the body mentioned here by Mark or in any of the other synoptic Gospels. The omission of these important steps provides the motivation for the women's return to the tomb on Sunday morning. The next step would have been to wrap the body in long sheets of linen. This is duly done for Jesus. It was as you were doing this that it was the custom to place herbs or spices between the layers of linen. As I just mentioned, the synoptics do not include this detail occurring. But John, however, in his Gospel, tells us that they used 75 pounds, around 35 kilograms of a mixture of myrrh and aloes. This is a vast quantity of this expensive substance. It's way more than would normally have been used. Does John want us to understand that when it comes to Christ, we are not to hold anything back? This may be true, but I'm more inclined to think that the quantity is reflective of the majesty of the person being bedded. This, you see, was the quantity that would be used for a royal personage. And a king was being bedded, and therefore a kingly quantity of herbs and spices would be used. The final thing to be done was to place a face cloth that would cover the face. The next thing they did was carry Jesus' wrapped body to the tomb site. Today, if we bury bodies in the cemeteries, we must dig down into the earth. We prepare a horizontal hole in which to lay the body flat. But this was not the way they did things in Palestine. Only very poor people were bedded in the ground. They would be placed in vertical shafts dug into some specifically designated fields. Most people, however, placed their bodies into holes, caves or vaults dug into the hillsides. Where possible natural caves or holes would be utilised. It's hard work to chip away at stone, so far better to use what exists naturally. If natural caves were not available, then spaces would be hewn from the rock. These were known as kokim, meaning niche in Hebrew. The most basic kokim resembled simple shelves carved into the rock on which bodies could be laid. If a family was wealthy, they may elect to make a more elaborate tomb. At times these tombs contained several rooms in which multiple family members could be laid. The bodies would remain in this state for about a year, and after this time had elapsed, family members would return to the tomb to collect the bones and place them in a box called an ossuary. This would be labelled with the person's name and then stored at the back of the tomb. Jesus' body was placed in a tomb that had been cut out of the rock. Matthew tells us that this was Joseph's own tomb and that he, more likely his servants, had cut it out of the rock. We don't know exactly what Jesus' bed or tomb looked like, but we do have surviving tombs of the period that can guide us. The entrance into the tomb was usually no higher than three feet. Inside there may be a ledge or ledges cut into the rock or stone or even a stone table on which to lay the body. The entrance would be closed or sealed by rolling across a large circular-shaped stone. If the tomb's owner was particularly wealthy, a groove may have been chiselled into the rock to make rolling the stone easier. With or without a guiding groove, the stone would have been heavy and may have required two or more men to roll it into place. Jesus then has been prepared and placed in his tomb. All of this had been done before the Sabbath had begun. 
Just a word here about the sacrifice made by Joseph and Nicodemus. In entering into Pilate, a Gentile's presence, they had made themselves ceremonially unclean. This was further compounded when they handled a dead body. All of this meant that they would be unable to participate in the Passover feast. It's difficult for us today to imagine what this meant to the Jews. To be now unable to enjoy this collective gathering and celebration would have been devastating to these prominent Jewish men. But they were willing to forsake their own needs in order to ensure that the Lord Jesus received a proper burial. But let's conclude today by looking at verse number 47. Verse 47. And Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph observed where he was laid. At first glance we might think it odd that Mark includes this rather trivial detail. Why tell us that two of the women who were at the cross saw where he was bedded? Its importance lies in providing valuable evidence against claims made regarding the resurrection. One of the less convincing claims made about the resurrection, or more accurately the empty tomb, was that the women simply went to the wrong place. This was why it was empty. Therefore, no miracle had taken place. This argument is without merit when we know that the two Marys witnessed firsthand where Jesus' body was laid. They observed and carefully remembered its location. And they did this for a very good reason. They intended to return. It's now the Sabbath, a day on which no work may be undertaken. The women will return early on Sunday morning in order to anoint Jesus' body. What happens next, Lord willing, will be the subject of our next sermon. Things to think about. I have two comments to make on today's passage of Scripture. Number one, being bold for Christ. In our account today, we read about the courage or the boldness of Joseph of Arimathea. He had to go and ask for a favour from a man who wielded great power and at times was little more than a tyrant. Pilate might have laughed in his face or openly mocked him. What is this man to you? Why are you wasting my time? Pilate might even have reported his request to another member of the Sanhedrin and that really would have made life difficult for Joseph. They would, I'm sure, have asked him some very tough questions. But none of these considerations seemed to deter Joseph. He boldly went ahead and did what was right. So what about us? How bold are we for Christ? Our boldness might manifest itself in a variety of ways. It might show itself in the boldness we exhibit in sharing our faith. Being bold in this area means courageously sharing the gospel message with others. Are you bold in this area? It might show itself in boldly standing on God's truth and resisting any compromise. Are you rock solid in what you believe and stand against what the culture today promotes? Or are you like a reed, bending in whichever direction the wind blows? I hope you are the former. It might show itself in simply having the courage to profess to others that you are indeed a follower of Christ, that you really love him and seek to obey what he has told you to do. Perhaps to some of you listening, that doesn't sound like being particularly bold. But to others, telling friends, co-workers or family members that you are a Christian requires great courage. Being courageous is not a jacket that comes in one single size. For each of us, courage or boldness varies. But all of us need it in one size or another. How sad it is today that the church in general and many professing Christians are wishy-washy or half-hearted in their commitment. How ineffective most of us are, due in part to our lack of boldness. The times are becoming more urgent. Now is the time for action and, and engagement. It's not the time for us to be fearful and cowardly. Boldness is a gift from God. We need to ask him through prayer and devotion to bless us with conviction, commitment and urgency. May we desire to be bold for Christ in this dark and dying world. Number two, the importance of attention. I love the Sherlock Holmes stories written by Arthur Conan Doyle. I've read them all multiple times. I particularly enjoy the exchanges that Holmes has with the ever-faithful Watson. Over time, 
and after having observed Holmes at work, Watson begins to believe that he too has picked up Holmes's special technique. Actually, Holmes's special technique revolves around very keen observation and then clever deduction or analysis of what these observances mean. Occasionally, Holmes will humour Watson and ask him to explain what he sees, and more importantly, what it means. Watson often does quite a good job, but when he has finished, Holmes always points out what he has failed to observe. This is frequently a vital clue needed to solve the case. The point I'm making is that in our Christian lives, we too need to be keenly attentive. This was demonstrated in our account today. In their great sadness, we could excuse the two Marys for not paying attention to where Jesus' body was placed. But had they not been watching closely, they would not have known where to go on Sunday following the Sabbath. We need to be attentive to properly see the people and the world around us. If we are wandering around in a daze, or are so wrapped up in our own affairs, we might easily miss the needs and opportunities that lie around us. At times in our busy and hectic lives, we can easily lose attention. If I throw you one ball, it's simple enough to catch. But if I throw two at once, it's harder to catch both. If I throw four or five balls at one time, it will be difficult, if not impossible, to catch them all. Life can at times be just like this analogy. With all of the things that we have to handle, it's easy to take our eyes off the most important thing. It's easy to lose our attention or to have our thoughts wander. The most important thing in our lives, of course, is the Lord Jesus Christ. Make no mistake, Satan loves nothing more than to distract us away from him. Satan's not fussy about where our attention goes, provided it's not on Jesus. Work, entertainment, social media, music, family issues, politics, financial concerns are all ways in which we can be distracted and lose our attention. So at times we all need a reminder. We need to take stock and run a check. Have we lost focus? Has our attention wandered? Lord, help us, we pray, to always have our hearts and minds fixed upon you. Help us to be attentive and observant so that we can faithfully serve you. May we be ever faithful servants who are ready to act when our master calls. Immediately in the morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. And they bound Jesus, led him away, and delivered him to Pilate. Then Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? It is as you say. And the chief priests accused him of many things, but he answered nothing. Do you answer nothing? See how many things they testify against you? But Jesus still answered nothing, so that Pilate marveled. Now at the feast, he was accustomed to releasing one prisoner to them, whomever they requested. And there was one named Barabbas, who was chained with his fellow rebels. They had committed murder in the rebellion. Then the multitude, crying aloud, began to ask him to do just as he had always done for them. But Pilate answered them, you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? For he knew that the chief priests had handed him over because of envy. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd so that he should rather release Barabbas to them. What then do you want me to do with him whom you call the king of the Jews? So they cried out again. Why? What evil has he done? But they cried out all the more. So Pilate, wanting to gratify the crowd, released Barabbas to them, and he delivered Jesus, after he had scourged him, to be crucified. Then the soldiers led him away into the hall called Praetorium, and they called together the whole garrison. And they clothed him with purple, and they twisted a crown of thorns, put it on his head, and began to salute him. Hail, King of the Jews! Hail, King of the Jews!
Then they struck him on the head with a reed and spat on him. And bowing the knee, they worshipped him. And when they had mocked him, they took the purple off him, put his own clothes on him, and led him out to crucify him. Then they compelled a certain man, Simon of Cyrenia, the father of Alexander and Rufus, as he was coming out of the country and passing by, to bear his cross. And they brought him to the place Golgotha, which is translated, place of a skull. Then they gave him wine mingled with myrrh to drink, but he did not take it. And when they crucified him, they divided his garments, casting lots for them to determine what every man should take. Now it was the third hour, and they crucified him. And the inscription of his accusation was written above, the King of the Jews. With him, they also crucified two robbers, one on his right and the other on his left. So the scripture was fulfilled, which says, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha! You who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests also, mocking among themselves with the scribes. He saved others. Himself he cannot save. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross, that we may see and believe. Even those who were crucified with him reviled him. Now, when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Hello, Lama, Sephotonis. Which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood by when they heard that said, Look, he's calling for Elisha. Then someone ran and filled a sponge full of sour wine, put it on a reed, and offered it to him to drink. Let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice, <laughs> and breathed his last. of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. So when the centurion who stood opposite him saw that he cried out like this and breathed his last, he said, Truly this man was the Son of God. <laughs> there were also women looking on from afar, among whom was Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James the Less and of Joses, and Salome, who also followed him and ministered to him when he was in Galilee, and many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. Now, when evening had come, because it was the preparation day, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent council member, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, coming and taking courage, went into Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate marveled that he was already dead, and summoning the centurion, he asked him if he had been dead for some time. So when he found out from the centurion, he granted the body to Joseph. Then he bought fine linen, took him down, and wrapped him in the linen. And he laid him in a tomb which had been hewn out of the rock, and rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. And Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joses observed where he was laid. 